not it's that thing again of not overreaching does this feel right is this sitting right you know you have to constantly be your own worst critic going oh is this crap this episode is brought to you by the best-selling book rise of the film entrepreneur how to turn your independent film into a money-making business learn more at filmbizbook.com i'd like to welcome to the show damon thomas how you doing damon Great, great. A bit tired. We had the screening last night, the premiere. There was like 300 people at Beyond Fest. Uh, so it was a big night. Uh, a lot of reactions, a lot of talking, but it was a, a great night. So, yeah, and I'm really pleased to be here. Great, my friend. Congratulations on your new film, My Best Friend's Exor- Exorcism, which is as insane as it sounds. Uh- <laughs> Right. It's got one of those titles like Sharknado. Like, you know what you're going to get. <laughs> I 100% agree with you. Like, as soon as I got sent that in my inbox, like, in 2019, and it was, like, my best friend's exorcism, I thought, this is brilliant. You know, you just can't wait to read it. And every moment since I got signed up to do it, where people say to me, hey, what are you up to? And I go, I'm doing my best friend's exorcism. People always smile. It's just, and I, then they go, wow, really? And you go, yeah. (laughs) I say, well, you know what it's about. (laughs) <laughs> exactly. It's about my best friend's exorcism. I mean, it's as it's as perfect. I mean, it's like Jaws. Like you know what you're gonna get. <laughs> Wait, no, it's great, right? And, um, and yeah. So, and then you say it's set in the eighties, and they go, "Great, done." <laughs> D- you had me at hello. Yeah, yeah, exactly. at hello. That's the brilliant part about it too. Is I was watching it, I'm just going, "Oh, the eighties." I mean, everyone's doing eighties stuff now, and Stranger yeah. Things has brought it back and made it cool yeah, again. So- but for my generation, and I'm assuming yours as well, the 80s, uh, you know, is awesome. <laughs> <laughs> so my simpler first question. Times. Simpler times, right? Oh, my God. Can you imagine? Oh God, simpler times when there was no internet, there was no social media. I mean, there was, you barely had remote controls on the television. <laughs> right. I mean, I, re- I mean, when you think about it, you had to, if you were going to meet someone, you phone them, and if you had a dial-up phone, do that <laughs> <thing> <laughs> <then>. <laughs> <laughs> and then you would slip. You would slip on like the seventh digit, and you go put the phone down and go, Argh! and then you start that whole thing again. And then you call your friend and say, like, I'll meet you there. Put the phone down. You go to that place, and if they weren't there, you were like, where are they? And then you'd have to find the phone box, call their house, and go, do you know where they are? And they go, well, they left twenty minutes. And you go like, no, no, it's that- like years <laughs> lost, years <laughs> of also, our lives. Also, you know, slight sort of off topic, but the feeling of boredom was something to behold back in the 80s. You know, but if you had nothing to do, there wasn't that instant kind of like dopamine hit of something new from your like, oh, let's go down a rabbit hole down the Internet now. And you would just used to stare and feel so bored. It was untrue. It was like a sort of sport. It was like profound boredom. Oh, and you had three channels. And if nothing was on that you liked, you were pretty much done until you yeah. had a friend who had cable. And yeah. then you would go over and maybe get three more channels. And yeah. then you'd be, and if there was nothing there, you have to go outside and actually interact with other human beings. Uh, scary. Yeah. Oh, you, it's ter- you, terrifying. Yeah. Oh, yeah. oh, yeah. Exactly. <laughs> or you had to like think of something to do, didn't you? You had to go read a book. Uh, I go, yeah, read. I mean, God, read a book. I mean, oh, wow. Anyway, yeah. It's just a bunch of now we just sound like two old farts talking I know. About, <laughs> about the I older days. I said it. It's just two old farts talking about the older days. <laughs> yeah, and I it, can't and it's too old. <laughs> exactly, exactly. So uh my first question, sir, is how and why did you want to get into this insanity that is the film business? Oh, you know, for me it started when I watched Blade Runner in the cinema. That'll do I, it. Just, I just went. I need to be in that, somewhere I need to be in that. I mean, even back then, there was so little information about what that was, Nothing. working in the film industry. It, there was like, we used to have this program that was just called Film, or whatever the year it was, that Barry Norman used to present. It was called Film 1985 or 1982. And then you would just watch that, and that was the only information. And then occasionally you'd have an arts documentary, and that was, there was nothing else. And then you might look up films in, in, in encyclopedias. And um, whereas oh now we're, we're dating ourselves so badly. I know, I know. <laughs> <laughs> but the funny thing is, my, my daughter, that who's like 15, will say to me, 
it was really interesting in that movie. They were like broke the fourth wall, and you know, she's got her oh. whole sort of like terms of reference about filmmaking and everything are so amazing that you kind of go, I just, you know, we were just in the darkness in the wilderness. And so, um, so that I kind of got into documentaries and then I kind of came, you know, it, it took me a long while to sort of find my route into drama and sort of directing drama. But uh, then of course I just always wanted to make a movie. Isn't it isn't it interesting, though, that you know, I have kids as well and, and they are, you know, much more educated than uh, because there's just so much more information about everything. Yeah. Now, I mean, the you would get the occasional Star Wars making of or the Indiana Jones making of. And that was pretty much it. I mean, you yeah. didn't see anything else until in the later 80s when, you know, then it started to become a little bit better. And then in the 90s yeah. with DVD commentaries and laser discs. Now, really yeah. old commentaries of the laser, the Criterion <laughs> laser discs and stuff like that. You wanted to hear, didn't you? You wanted to hear like how people did stuff. You, it was like, um, you know, behind the curtain, the Wizard of Oz. It's like, how are they doing this stuff? How is it being made? How do you do this? And uh, whereas now there are, um, you can just go on YouTube and go like, how do you do that? I'll just put it in, you know, and I'll find someone telling me how it's done or someone would have made a film about it. And it's, that is sort of great because it opens it up to everybody. Way. Makes... But but then then the bad thing is it opens it up to everybody. <laughs> so yeah, yeah. Like, <laughs> yeah. So now before right. you didn't have as much competition. Like I always yeah. tell people, like in the eighties, if you finished a film on thirty five, it was sold. Like you yeah. just good, bad. I mean, Toxic Avenger got theatrical yeah. release. Like it doesn't really yeah. matter. But now everybody's making a movie and now it's about getting seen and, and all of that kind of stuff. But you yeah. were saying about your daughter knowing how the reference from references yeah. about that. The generation that's come, that is now, it is so educated in story. Yes. It is so difficult for the, for us as filmmakers, as storytellers, yes. to make something that's interesting that doesn't hasn't been done before. And every year that goes by, it's getting harder and harder yeah. and harder to yeah. because you know things that worked in the seventies and eighties just don't they can't work. And like I've, I was I was showing, I've, I think it was some kids were watching Rocky the other day. Rocky. Rocky. Yeah. And they're like, eh. because every because they've just seen everybody rip off Rocky. Yeah, of course. For the last 40, 50 years. Yeah. So it doesn't have the same umph to it as it used to. So it's it, how do you as a storyteller kind of kind of deal with that? Because it is something very, very difficult. Things that Hitchcock yeah. never had to deal with. No. We, we no, do. You're right. Uh I mean, I suppose every genre has tropes. Um, so and the, you know, the horror genre is a very broad church from slasher movies to psychological horror, to sci-fi horror, you know, to Alien, Aliens and those amazing movies, to kind of comedy horror. And so you, you know, the, the Exorcist is sort of like the benchmark of like the hand, it's a handbook of how to, you know, do you, are you going to do the vomit? Are you going to do the, you know, are you going to do, and, and how are you going to do it? And uh, it's sort of interesting because you're always going to disappoint someone. You're always going to, someone's going to go, well, I wasn't scary. But the thing about it is I didn't want, want the film to have this sort of tone that felt like an 80s movie. And then it kind of went into a completely new realm of like, oh, my, you know, where did that come from? Right. And I wanted it to stay within the same thing. So the exorcism for me was a great... I thought, can we pull off this thing where it's kind of scary and quite disturbing, but then it's funny, it's like relieved by this real character of Christian Lemon. And the thing is, because once you, he's sort of desperate, uh, but, um, and you know, when I, when I first met Chris, we were talking about it at rehearsal, I said, he's sort of a loser, but he's kind of a bit cocky, but he- A cocky loser, he, a cocky loser. <laughs> yeah, and he does want this, he does want it really badly. So that when the demon shows himself and he just goes like, yes, he has a demon. And does a high five and she's totally traumatized. And for me, and it was great watching it last night because people really enjoyed that moment and uh, really enjoyed Christian Lemon. And I think actually it's, it showed me that there's kind of quite a nice group dynamic when you, I think you could really watch this movie with a group of friends. Oh yeah. I, it's not like, I don't think it's a sort of, well, you know, people watch, obviously, watch your mobile device, devices all the time. But it actually made me really think about that 
group experience of watching movies. You know, I went to the cinema, as I see Thor with my son, you know, a, a week ago. And you know, it's, it, it is great being in a cinema, isn't it? There's something that is so, uh, that's why I thought, thought last night, I thought it actually really helps when <laughs> everyone's going through Cause like when, when, the, when the, she burns him, Andras, yeah, they, they all cheered last night. It was fantastic. You know, it's, I was totally not expecting it. But it's primal. Theatrical yeah. experiences, it's a primal experience. We're all around the fire. Yeah. It's a primal thing and group experiences of a story where, you know, the core of all stories is, is basically to teach us not to be eaten by the tiger down the street. Yeah. You yeah. know, around around the corner. That was the point of right. stories around the campfires. They were, And then they evolved into morals and lessons and things. And now it's entertainment because we get a yeah. lot of the meat and potatoes from other yeah. other kind of media. But it is. Yeah, you're absolutely right. Without question. Now, uh, go ahead. And just to, also just to pick up on that point is I think that. Even if you have never made a uh, movie, TV, uh, and you know, but you've people sort of absorb so much about you. Sort of watch something, you go, "They're going to get together. He's going to die. He won't." Right. You know, you just feel it, right? You feel you know that. It. You know it because you know how these things work. You sort of so that when you get like uh, you know, say a series like Severance or Station Eleven. You're on TV, you let you go. I've got no idea where this is going, and they they feel quite refreshing. And I wanted to do some things where you sort of felt. I thought, wouldn't it be funny if this felt like a movie that someone thought they hadn't seen from the eighties? So it had a bit of an eighties vibe, and but also if you had an Exorcist that was just so unlike any Exorcist you've seen before, and and to really, but to make him so we, I really set him up. So that when he comes to do the exorcism, you really enjoy him. So that with the high fives that he's always doing. Up to, you know, that <laughs> stuff. But, yeah, but, you know, he is cheesy. But, you know, there were weightlifting Christian evangelists. If you put it on YouTube, you can see these guys pumping iron for Jesus. And they existed. They were real. They were real people. So it's not far-fetched. And he is a real person. He is like... Tosi believes that, you know, his purity and <laughs> I mean, I even really like it that he can't remember Gretchen's name. You know, he comes out in the middle of it, goes, you know, what's her name? It's so true because it's all about him. <laughs> obviously, obviously. No, it, it's 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 brilliant. And you're right. It's so because we've just seen it so much and yeah. we've seen it and we've seen it done well and we've seen it done bad. You know, so yeah, like. True. If you're gonna see a shark, if you're gonna see a shark movie and you've seen Jaws, yeah. it's gonna it's gonna be tough for you to figure out a new way to do a shark movie because it was done pretty much yeah. flawlessly the first yeah, time. Exactly. And the Exorcist, and and the Exorcist is it's the same thing. Yeah. It's flawless. And also, some people then get disappointed if you don't do the things that have been done before because you're like, like, well, what happened to that? Where's that been? You know, and they go. Uh, but you're like you were saying, how do you do it different? You're all trying to find ways to, you know, like reinvent the wheel. And it's already been filmed and done like a thousand times. So you are you're in kind of familiar territory. But, you know, I did want to, yeah, as best as I best could just get that tone right. And, you know, uh, if people, you know, you can only do what you can do. You know, there's always. Yeah. Yeah, listen, it's, we're in the we're in the world of everyone has an opinion, and everyone can f express that opinion on uh, Rotten Tomatoes or on you know comments and things like that on social media. But at the end of the day, as a filmmaker, you just got to do what you got to do. One thing yeah. I did love about about the movie is that you are able to balance humor and horror, which is not easy. It is not easy to do that as a filmmaker, okay. as, a as a storyteller, because I've seen really bad. Because if the balance is off, I've seen bad horror comedies where if the balance is off, right. you know, like Evil Dead 2 and Army of Darkness, like they, they'll, those movies, you know, what Sam, Sam in general, it can do no <laughs> harm, no wrong in my eyes. But yeah, he, but he's able to balance that. And you were able to balance the horror and the comedy beautifully in this film because oh, it's not yeah. it's not easy. man. It's not easy. Yeah, I mean, I think it comes from truth, I think. If your characters feel like the real article, even if they are heightened, I mean, we all, we all know people that feel quite heightened types, don't you? You're going to meet people who are strong flavors, and they're real people. And Christian Lemon is a strong flavor. And uh, but 
it, yeah, but as long as he's being truthful to that character in that set of circumstances, and it's sort of balanced with, you know, Abby's kind of like sheer, like, oh my God, you know, you know, it's, it, it, it was one of the things I put in because he just sort of said, oh, she needs an exorcism. And it, originally she, she went, well, how do I do that? I just sort of, I kind of said, she would really, really go, what? <laughs> you know, it's not a normal thing, you know. Generally speaking. But because, because it's, a, it's an exorcism movie, it doesn't mean that everyone knows that, you know, an exorcism is something that is actually real. So, uh, <laughs> so he talks in that really patronizing way, but he gets the yoga and he goes, there's an exorcism, there's a demon inside it. And he's, you know, <laughs> he's really patronizing to her. And I thought that's exactly what he would say. Like, like, are you stupid? <laughs> and he's like, come on, of course it's just a demon. Yeah. And so to your point is that if you have, it's like in Killing Eve, I did a scene where Eve kills a guy with an axe, like being spurred on by Villanelle. But that, that scene is quite funny because right. the axe gets stuck in his back and so she can't pull it out. And so she's being shouted at by him, and I like hit him again. And she's going, I can't with axe. It's the... And the guys are going, ah! And so it's kind of really disturbing, but it is funny because, and I think those things can sit right next to each other. Like, because the Coen brothers do it all the time. Oh. They kind of, you know, they put like, and I think that it's it's a bit like when you go to a funeral, that you feel like sometimes doing the other thing that you're not meant to, like laughing because it's the relief in tension that you need because of the emotional expectation. You know, oh, did, you're... Did, did, I'm sorry, I don't mean to interrupt you, but did you, when you said no. funeral, do you rem- I don't know if you saw this online somewhere, but some guy died, okay, he died. And at his funeral, he, he put a speaker, he had his family put a speaker inside of the, inside of the casket. And <laughs> as, they're, as they're, this is part of his wishes, as it's being laid down, like, hey, 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 no, 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 I'm alive. I'm alive. No, 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 no. And he's hitting and knocking and, and it's, and people are pissing themselves. I mean, the kids, everyone's crying, but then everyone starts laughing because they know it's what he would do. I'm like, oh my God, that is so brilliant. That that is brilliant. That is fantastic. That's forward planning as well, isn't it? That's real forward planning. That's yeah, yeah. I think he was sick and he was gonna die. He's like, I'm gonna do this. I'm gonna do this right. And my favorite tombstone ever is like, I told you I was ill. (laughs) <laughs> that's brilliant very very good now so when you started your career damon i'm assuming that uh the second you said i'm going to be a director that the trucks of money came in all the doors came wide open and said david whatever you want to do all you have is time and money <laughs> oh my god if only yeah <laughs> uh, i yeah no i've had it's a long journey i mean i did a degree in physics and i of course oh, because <laughs> that's a prerequisite to be a filmmaker. <laughs> yeah. And then I just got a job in, uh, you know, uh, I got a job in BBC News and then I gave that up to go and work on an arts program. And then I gradually just did more and more documentaries. They did drama documentaries with uh, about Beethoven and uh, <clears throat> other things. And then I got, uh, yeah, just got a break, you know. Um, I, someone actually approached me to do a drama documentary and I said, why don't we just do a drama? It was set in the Antarctic, and we had like 120,000 uh, pounds <laughs> to make it set. The, and I, I, when I filmed it inside an art, a sort of ice fridge, it was all set uh, on, a, on one of um, Scott's Antarctic missions. So that, so that their breath was all sort of because there's no, yeah. no, no budget for VFX, no budget for VFX. <laughs> yeah, and we, and we snowed up a studio that was tiny. And um, yeah, it was, yeah, so it started back then in 2006. So yeah, it's been a long road. You know, it's been a lot of there's a lot of miles on the, on the t- <laughs> miles on the tires, as they say. Miles yeah, on the exactly. Tires. So, the, so the question is though, because a lot of filmmakers listening are going through these these stages, and again, even in 06, yeah. it was a different world than we are today. Like you know, yeah, we're, we're, it, it's so much more difficult to get in now than it was in the early 2000s. How did you keep going? Is there any advice you can give to filmmakers listening? Right. I mean, obviously back then it was a bit like if you wanted to make a record, you know, you were like you could, you just couldn't afford to go into a recording studio. So they seemed very out of touch, beyond reach. I think the good thing about today is you can make a, a movie on your iPhone. And I think the thing what you 
learn by just doing it is sort of, um, uh, you know, how do you make something that just kind of engages people, you know? And I think that that's the thing. If just start making stuff, even if it's, you, you know, you and a friend, do something about your life. Something that's kind of like, you could be filming your own house or in your garden or down the park or things that you can, so they don't need huge production. So it sets something contemporary and just start sort of just putting something together. Because the thing is, that's what people judge you about. They kind of look at you and see, have you got a voice? Have you got a story? Can you do something funny? Can you make something? And, you know, um, it's, it's amazing how you can engage people with something very small. It's like, don't overreach. Uh, that's always the thing about filmmaking is, you know, don't just spend all your money on one shot and then the rest of the film feels like it's had no money. You've really but, got to think- but Kubrick, like, but Kubrick and Scorsese did it, why can't I? <laughs> but you know, you know, I was reading the other day because I love The Shining. Um, oh, it's, it's, my, you know, it's one of my favorites. Okay, yeah, it's one of my favorites. Me too, right? It's such an amazing film. And, you know, uh, Jack Nicholson axed 60 dolls to get his Johnny. That's it, over three days. I mean, I mean, <laughs> can you imagine? Can you imagine taking one of the biggest movie stars in the world today and you're not Stanley Kubrick and going, yeah, or, or David Fincher at this point, and yeah, and just That's doing it. 60 60 Dawn takes. number 40, get door number 40, and they're like, they're exhausted, like axing doors. <laughs> I think, I, mean, I, know, I think Fincher, say, I, I, no, I'm sorry, but I think <laughs> Fincher on social network. I, when when uh, I think Andrew Garfield had to smash the the um, the laptop, yeah, and the, they did like forty of them. They had, he had literally forty laptops sitting wow. there because Crazy. he knew it was good. It because that's David Fincher. <laughs> yeah, I mean, yeah, it's uh, we it's, we don't all have that. I mean, you know, he's t- t- <laughs> you could say he's right because he turns out brilliant films, right? Hey, it's his process. Social network <laughs> is it? You know, The Shining is a masterpiece. Um, uh, and they change, they change filmmaking, don't they? They change sort of that, you know. When I when I was doing Killing Eve, that I was quite influenced by, you know, Jack Torrance when he's sitting there and the, and the whole dance is going on behind him. This whole, oh, I know, and it's so like at the edge of the world, sort of madness. And so when I did Killing Eve, I suggested that we do this, did this kind of like afternoon tea dance. So you go into this environment. And Villain, I was waiting there, and there's this old fashioned music playing, all these people just dancing, and it's like the edge of time. And I just, you get really influenced by oh, that, you know. Um, but sorry, we're, we're sort of digressing. I mean, if, if, in terms of filmmaking, you just have to do, if, the more you do, the more you sort of learn, because you sort of realize, oh, sound is quite important here, good sound, you know, and it gets yes. forgotten, you know, sound, you know, to get great sound that you can actually use. You know, because a lot of times we have to do re-recording. A lot of dialogue was just like planes and all sort of fridges on in the background. And, you know, someone just decides to sort of, you go to the quietest place in the world. And on that day, there's a guy getting his tree cut down. And there's like, and you go over, you go like, people go over and go, can you not cut your tree down? He goes, no, it's, it's, I've paid for it. And, you know, you're like, going, oh my God. <laughs> but, you know, it's all those, and you learn how, I mean, you know, working at, you know, as a, I started as a trainee news editor, you start realizing, oh, you can cut that picture with that picture. They sort of cut together. Oh, yeah. How do you cut those? Oh, we actually need a cutaway on that, like a, a detailed shot, because it, tell, it helps me tell that story. And you realize that sort of objects, if you see objects in someone's room, it, you can actually tell exactly who they are very quickly. And so art direction and all the bits, you, you know, it's like a messy desk. It's interesting how some people do a messy desk, but it sort of looks like a sort of presentation. You know, because messy desks actually have smears on them and bits of crumbs and, you know, it's all that kind of thing that you start to, you know, you become, you know, uh, over the, you just become super observant about things in a kind of really all the time, things that you sort of, that make all the difference. Now, you may be watching it as a kind of viewer and go like, it doesn't feel right. It doesn't feel like a real thing. But you can't put your finger on why it doesn't feel real. You know, it's a bit like um, door frames. In a real house, they tend to have quite a lot of scuffs lower down because of all the things that have gone through them over time. Now, if they look pristine, it looks like a new build. You know, it's sort of, it's all those, 
details that you start to get quite attuned to as a director when you start doing stuff. Um, but, you know, story is king. You know, what's the story? And is it engaging? It's sort of like you can dress things up with, you can spend millions on effects, but if they don't engage you about the human condition, then you end up going, I don't care. You know, it, you're going to see a film that costs $100 million. You sort of go, mm. <laughs> because we've seen everything, haven't we? I you mean, look, if, the, if, if Jurassic Park was just a bunch of dinosaurs walking around and be like, it'd be a documentary. You needed a story. You needed to connect to those characters. You needed the magic yeah. that, that Spielberg brings in. Do you know, on a side note, since you're such a, a Kubrick fan, do you know, I'm sure you do know this, but he, I think it was for Eyes Wide Shut. He right. had his assistant run for a year, run around. Oh, the theater? The no, not the theaters. No, no, the the side tables. Of, of of couples in a bed and he'd just go into people's houses ah, and yeah. just take hundreds, hundreds of pictures of just how people kept the side tables at night. Yeah. And he wow. just used them as reference to build out his side tables for, wow. and you, but who- It's like that pizza thing, isn't it? You just can't, but you know, you're talking about someone who spent seven years prepping that movie. Yeah, and yeah. it was great that he did, but it was horrible that he did because we didn't get more Stanley Kubrick films. I would yeah, die. Right. I would love to see what Stanley would do with today's technology. Can you imagine? Yeah. You imagine? I, I mean, you, it, I mean, you know, two thousand and one. It's just again, <laughs> it's so clever and so so interesting. You know, that was sort of being made in the late sixties, and um, it's kind of amazing. You sort of. Uh, they are different times, and he was a, a particular, you know, very particular director. Um, you know, I'm, I'm also a big fan of like Ridley Scott. You know, oh. I think people yeah. people are still trying to make Alien and Blade, Blade Runner. Runner. Yeah, they're still trying to make the, those are the benchmarks in the way that you know it's you know that sort of dirty future, like rain soaks, sort of the clash of kind of like different cultures from around the world. You know. That whole feeling, I, you know, it's, it, of course they were, they were slightly, you can feel it from the effects point of view, but they, they're so, the characters are so great and the stylization mixed together, that kind of, you know, the realization of it is, uh, they, you know, they had such an impact on me. Um, mm -hmm. um, and yeah, it's why these, you know, you can still go back to those films. That's what I think about how many films you actually revisit and rewatch. Mm -hmm. You know, Ap Apocalypse Now, you know, blew my mind when I watched it. Uh, I can still rewatch that film every single time because it's, you still see something new in it and you just think it's so incredible. And, mm -hmm. uh, though, you know, and the conversation, you know, another amazing, amazing film. And, but also great, you know, surveillance. You know, I like, I really like the other movie, um, uh, The Lives of Others, which is another surveillance movie you know, another brilliant film. Because they're all about the human condition, but they just tell a, a great stories, really well told. And uh, I think that that's what you're always trying to do. I mean, you know, mm -hmm. whether we succeed. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> it's not easy, man. Listen, it's not easy telling a, good, I mean, telling a good story. I mean, if you're a good storyteller, and even the best storytellers that we have in the film industry, they don't get it every time. No. I mean, there's very few that have impeccable uh, no. Philographies. Some, no. Sometimes things no, happen. Absolutely. Essentially, and the thing is, you know, nobody sets out to make a big pile of crap. You know, you know, no one sort of says, you know, this year I'm going to really. I'm going to make the work. I'm going to go make cats. I'm going to make cats. Let's go make cats. <laughs> Forty million. Just you know, what, <laughs> just then move on. Do something good. I mean, it's you know, just everyone, like <laughs> everyone. You know, it's it. It kind of you know. It's a lot of people's lives, you know, spent yeah. dedicated to doing something. And that's yeah. why, of course, you know, I think it, it, it just takes a huge, I think the thing about it is just not, it's that thing again of not overreaching. Does this feel right? Is this sitting right? You know, you have to constantly be your own worst critic going, oh, is this crap? What is this? Is this, you know, you have to, and also you have to be able to work with people that you trust their opinion. So that when they go, that's why, you know, Robert Evans was such a great producer because he was able to tell, that's the trouble if you become, you know, a celebrated director, um, you know, can you take criticism? Can someone take, give you a note and go, is that any good? You know, and you go, you're right, actually, I think that's, 
And that's what I think sometimes does happen. I mean, look, you know, uh, if, if, you, if someone, you know, if you can make one shiny in your life, you'd be happy, wouldn't you? Oh, my God. <laughs> Could you imagine? You? I would I'd take any, almost any movie out of, out of Stanley's filmography and go, I'll, I'll take that one. I mean, yeah, I mean, you know. I'll take, you, I'll take Full you know, Metal, and, I'll take Eyes Wide Shut. I mean, he would, wouldn't you? I mean, if, and that's why these guys are amazing and you just keep kind of, you know, going back and to all. the reading thing. Yeah, and, there's, there's not, and that, that's why I kind of judge a film on, would I rewatch it? Right. Unless it's like really disturbing, but I don't want to rewatch it because I find it too disturbing. But, you know, uh, and it's funny how you can, if Jaws is on, you go, actually, I watch a bit of Jaws. You know, when you just see it on the streaming platform, you go, I'm going to watch that tonight. Mm-hmm, <laughs> and absolutely. you just will go back to it, won't you? And kind of re, you know, because also these actors that are in there, you know, re, you know Dreyfus, it's oh, just so, God. they're so good, aren't they? There's such, oh, the so way that they inhabit those characters is... Uh, is, remar- is remarkable. Now, and let me ask you, you know, as a directors, we, there's always that day on set that we feel the entire world is coming down, crashing around us. Generally, yes. that's every day. That's every day, generally. But there's always the <laughs> I always one. the heart in the vice. The vice <laughs> slowly. <laughs> so, so there's that one day that that's really bad. And, you know, the camera doesn't work, lost the location, the guy's cutting the tree next door. What, yeah. <laughs> what was that day for you on uh, My Best Friend's Exorcism and how did you overcome it? Uh, God, let me, I'm trying to think of those days. Um, let me think. Tell me if we had like a true shocker of a day on that. Mm-hmm. That's good. Because, yeah, because it, the thing about it is I've been doing it so long that you literally, it's like this sort of thing that when it comes, you're just going, yeah, well, you just let it, you sort of have to absorb it. And uh, like I say, filmmaking is like the same, but always different because of the actors and the team that you have. There's always that combination and there's always something that will just go wrong. And you just have to, I think doing documentaries for years that uh, allowed me to sort of pivot in a way of just going, because I used to always turn up places like I'd never been before and I meet people, film them, and they're going to film some shots. And you were just making it up on literally, if you didn't get to recce, because so you couldn't sort of fly to America and meet the guy and go home again and go back and do it. You would just go and film them. And so um, you sort of, so it's kind of like taught me that don't get too rigid. A- apart from like action sequences when you have to really plan them, storyboard them, and then pick off shots, which takes a very, very long time. Um, it's why like Bond has like the main unit and then it has the the action unit and they're running for like six months next to each other because of there's so many shots. But uh, <clears throat> I think that sort of doing documentaries for so long, I just kind of, if things sort of go wrong, I can just go, well, let's try and do something else. It doesn't floor me. I kind of go, you know, and, and things just happen all the time, you know. And the classic one is, uh, you've got a driving sequence and you just go to the guy, right, just drive the car over there. And they go, oh, I don't drive. <laughs> I, I had it but once. They, but on your headshot, went, but on your headshot, you say you ride horses, you play the guitar and you yeah. drive. That's one of your special I, I, skills. I always remember one guy sort of said, no, I, I, I spent the money on, on dance lessons. That's what he said to me. And I was a bit like, you know, I literally just said, can you just drive the car over here? It was like a really small moment. Was like, and so we had to put him in the seat behind, in the back seat, no. and film in such a way and just mind the steering wheel when someone just drove in front of him and we got away with it. It's just that it's just you just choose a camera angle and uh, you know it's just so you just like pivot. You just kind of go like you literally thought of course no one's asked him if he drives. Uh <laughs> But it's but basically directing is compromise in so many ways. It's constantly compromising and 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 pivoting and shifting because and I don't know about you. I love to walk on set with uh and scare the hell out of my my ad with uh, like 150 shots on my shot list every yes. day. He likes oh, goes. Are you insane? And they're like, and they're like you are. You, we have eight yeah. hours, and I'm like, yeah. I they're there in case things go well. I know I'm going to shoot 20 of them, but yeah, <laughs> yeah. exactly. And I think that it is a sort of career of patience, of just, I mean, when you think about it, as you all know, it's um, that most of the day is spent lighting. Mm -hmm. Lighting is, you know, and lighting is key. It makes 
everything looked great. And you just, so you know, you block, side of your shots, you sit, and then you start lighting. I mean, you, know, you just spend a lot of time lighting. So it's like riding that wave of, oh, you know, waiting for lighting. <laughs> But, you know, and that's not me denigrating the director of photography. It's just no. like that is the life, isn't it? It's the life of just kind of finding that inner... That it's, inner zen, that inner zen of place. You're like, okay, we're ready. Oh, okay, three hours. Two, how many? Two hours? Two hours? It's Because yeah. they'll tell, you, they'll tell so, you 90 minutes, but it's going to be two hours. <laughs> I mean, and the other interesting thing, I think, is that people who don't work in the industry often say, but, you, you know, when you work with actors, they go, but you're the director. They just do what you say. And you kind mm -hmm. of go doesn't quite work that way. <laughs> it doesn't, you know, that's not how it works. And they just don't understand that. It's a very, you know, because actors do something that's really unique and special. And it's such a exposing and amazing thing that it's not just about, you, you know, you do that over there. It's not that. <laughs> it's a kind no. of proper creative relationship that you sort of embark on. Um, isn't it interesting though when when uh, normies I call them normies people outside of the carnival business that is our our world <laughs> come on set and they've only seen like behind the scenes yeah. and everything's edited so it, like on set yeah, seems like pop, 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 pop. It's, it's you're going fast <laughs> and they're sitting there like three hours later they're sitting in the chair with the, with the headphones on for sound and they're like this is boring as crap and I'm like oh, it yeah. is it, it's like it is. on a marvel on a marvel movie they'll spend what 8 hours lighting for one shot yeah <laughs> because yeah. that's they have all the money in the uh, world I mean, to make like, it you know, right. Tim, Tim Burton will just shoot two shots in a day and he'll just spend the whole morning just re rehearsing rehearsing a big shot that has a lot of moving parts and that's what you do you have to if you're going to shoot a shot you got to shoot it well or don't shoot it this is the crazy thing sometimes about shooting is don't shoot that's another i think that's another thing i'd always say don't shoot i'll say crap but you know uh, <laughs> uh don't shoot rubbish shoot stuff because you're always going to look at it later and go, oh why didn't i just i knew you know i knew i had to i know that i and the thing about it is that's what you have to do as a director you have to go it's not right we need to you know, it doesn't feel right. Let's and sometimes you set for a shot and you have to have the confidence. And it might have taken quite a long time to put the camera down there and the rigging, all the guys, the grips. And then you start looking at it and go, it's not right. We just actually need to be over here. And you have to have the confidence to go strip it all out and have people around you that, that kind of go, Yes, you're making so yeah, we do we we see it. And also don't get sort of then also admit that you're doing something wrong sometimes, like mm, this actually, you know. I was I wrong, but that takes time to build up because when you're it first on, when you're first on set, you just don't want to look like you don't know what you're doing. Of course. But as you get older and you've got more more shrapnel yeah. uh, totally in you, different. you just go, guys, I, I made a mistake. Let's let's go over here. This is just not working. Let's yeah. Say, yeah. It's gonna take two hours. I'm sorry. Let's go. Yeah, and and you you'll you'll never regret it because you're as you know you're just the footage that you get will be like you think thank god thank god because you might as well shoot something great that took twice as long i mean it depends about obviously jeopardizing a location whatever you have to that's why it's a sort of system of moving parts you're always going oh my god can we you know we're only in here for one day like the interior of the weird little house you know the, where it happens was actually the, like the upstairs corridor in this other building. If you saw it from the outside, you'd never believe that we were that was the inside of the house. But we got real freedom to like smash it up inside. But we had such limited time in there, you know. You just, you know. But is it? But it, but isn't it true though that you have to sit once in the edit room and go, "Why didn't I move the camera? Why did I accept that shot when I knew?" Something yeah. inside me was telling me, no, you've got to, but you didn't have the balls or the confidence to yeah. change. And or, but, the but once, <laughs> or the, yeah, and you're in the edit and you're edit and you're in the edit room and you're like, God, I need we either like, oh God, I gotta get saved somehow with this. Yeah. These are lessons you learn along yeah. the way. And, and then you eventually do. you just like, I know I'll, I'll get the shots that I need. I I gotta shoot the, the ashtray. Why? Because I need a freaking cutaway. Uh, yeah. <laughs> to save yeah, my no, ass, just in case. Yeah, and and, and it's just yeah, yeah. And also you have, to, you have to rely on people around you. You just have to rely a lot. Uh, but yeah, you, 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 you sort of 
over the years, you also you sort of see the problems coming. I think that's what happens. That's what I sort of see. You sort of go, I know that we do this. That's not going to work probably because you've sort of been there like ten times sure. before. Sure, sure, sure. Thank you. You sort of that and that kind of that and that's why experience I think counts for a lot. You know, mm-hmm. the, you without, know. without question. I, especially when you where if you move and do different kind of genres occasionally, you sort of come over here. You. You sort of think, well, I've done a shot like that. I did a shot with someone underwater. I did that crash. I did someone leaning over, you know, and I just did it by putting a green screen. And it's also knowing sometimes people can't, like, I just, yeah, I just did a thing about the Black Panthers in the early 70s, and we just needed someone that was on Mar Holland. And I just saw a sort of shape in a park with a pathway. I thought it'd be great, actually, because you put the car here, just put a green screen around it. Everyone's sort of going, like, are you mad? You know, I think, but we did it. Because I just knew it would work, the shape, and I could, it felt like a sort of lookout point that you could put a car on and it had a, you know, and you just, um, it's like we, we did a sort of, uh, we had, had to recreate the Mexican border and we literally did it in like an Ikea car park. <laughs> and so you go on the, you go on the tech wrecking, you go, and it's just as concrete. <laughs> and it was literally going, I don't get it. I just don't see it. And you have to say, well, we put all the crossings here put the fence there, put all the trucks here. We put like a blocking load of t- big trucks on that side. And then it just sort of, it, it sort of you have to visualise it. I think that, that becomes a thing as well, that you start to visualise things within spaces. And I think that that is another thing you start to see because right. you start thinking, I, I, I do think, and it's not all, it depends what you're like as a director, I don't know about you, but I like photography. So I like... Yeah, I did, yeah, so you sort of like, I like photographs, you know, you, you get quite into composition and it's a bit like taking photos that people just, you know, when you think about it, a lot, you always take a photo sort of at shoulder height like this. It's rare mm-hmm. you sort of get on the floor and go like, oh, let's do that. You know, you're out, you're not going to lay on the floor, are you? You're never going to put the camera down there. But you have to start thinking about that when you start shooting as a director. You, you sort of think, well, where can the camera grow and how does it make me feel about what I'm looking at, putting the camera in different positions? And that's another thing you start freeing yourself up about not just going, here we are. <laughs> but doing right. you know. Right. <laughs> but uh, sometimes the sim- sometimes the simplest things are just just as effective. That's yeah. the other thing. Don't oh, get yeah, just hung like- up on just making things really flashy because in the end it's the performance and the writing that are going to sell it all. I mean, you could look at some John Ford shots and you're just like, well, that's a masterpiece. And they just have to, and he just locked the camera off. Yeah. And, and, and lock it's the radio. you know, just lock just it think, off. Just look at just, you know, um, it's insane. yeah. And, but you know, that's a lot to do with location, isn't it? And get it just sort of going, we've got to go all the way to this remote place and do that shot. No, but no, no. Ikea, 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 Ikea <laughs> and a green screen. You've got Lawrence of Arabia. What are you talking about? David? Exactly. That's all you need nowadays. If he would have had Ikea and some green screen, we wouldn't even, the desert. That's he, crazy. That's right. He'd, been, he'd have been down. He wouldn't be on Santa Monica so, Beach. So my, so my last question to you, sir, is if you were able to go back in time and talk to your younger self, is there one piece of advice you would give, oh. him, give him one piece of advice about your filmmaking journey. Like, dude, you know, you really need to look out for this. I think um, is to do as much of it as you can. Sort of don't kind of just be waiting for the one moment that you feel is coming at a certain point in time. Just start shooting things. Just make a small film. Even if it's like, um, a, a, you know, a drama set in your own house with your family. You know, if you're... Just think of a story. And, and, and also, if it comes from you, your own experience, then it will be truer, won't it? So that if, you, if something has happened to you, and you can do it. And you'll be surprised at who can act sometimes as well. You know, you're, And then by shooting something, and keep it very small, just do something very limited, and just see if you can make a narrative last for like two minutes or three minutes and put some music on it. Then I think I... Think I Obviously, back then, there was a sort of, we didn't have you know, the technology, whereas now, I know. you could just do it. And I think that 
in a way, we have too many tools, <laughs> you know. And not I mean, enough no, story. I, and not enough story. <laughs> it's true, though, isn't it? And so, so kind of you, it, uh, you know, what's the everything, everywhere, all at once? That movie. You oh, know, how, Daniels. Oh, that'd be great. Oh, what amazing, what an amazing kind of, but also very, very uh, interesting about the human condition, isn't it? It's all about what people mean to each other and what, yep. and, and it's, it's. I mean. People with Frank Flirty fingers. I mean, it's <laughs> when I had them on the show, I'm like, dude, hot dog fingers, guys, seriously? And they're like, yeah, we were we were high. So uh, <laughs> is that what they said? <laughs> I think they said something along those lines. <laughs> because like, you, this is insane, guys. This is insane. You know, you, that's what I love about that film is like uh, it's like we learn to express ourselves with our feet. And I think Jamie, Jamie Lee Curses is there. And then this little foot just covers up her face as such. I just thought. And the thing is, it's nuts, but it's true to them. It's very true. It's perfect. You know? and, it's perfect. And, and I thought that's just really clever and just funny, very funny and touching. And uh, so oh, they, they're great, those guys. God, they they're, are great. They're, Damon, I could keep talking to you for about another five, six hours about geeking out oh, over. I mean, we could just start talking about Kubrick for an hour alone. Um, oh, where can it. people where can people see your new film, My Best Friend's Exorcism? It's on Amazon Prime Video now. It's it's released today, the first of September, and uh, yeah, so perfect Halloween um, film, perfect Halloween film. Yeah, well, watch it with friends. Yes, yeah, <laughs> like my first AD, Steve Moore, fantastic guy. He's doing a party tonight. They're re they're re enacting one of the uh, uh, Lemon Brothers <laughs> scenes tonight. Nice <laughs> with his nice. friends. So I just yeah, fantastic. Yeah, watch but it with a, with a group. My friend, congratulations on the film, man, and continued success with, with uh, I can't wait to see your next films uh, coming oh, up, my friend. So I appreciate you, my friend. Thank you again. Thank you. Thank Alex. It's been brilliant. Thank you.